Thank you very much. And first of all, well done. Not many of you, but well done for staying committed to the very end. I really appreciate your time. Um, today is very much, my session is very much about some practical tools. All right. So I'll give a bit of a big picture stuff, but then very much share a range of tools that hopefully are useful and helpful, no matter what your role is. It says about leadership, but we can use these in a whole range of different ways. So very briefly, my background, I used to be a special school principal in the UK. I've uh, been in Australia now 15 years. Uh, as you can see, not much impact on my accent. I think I've got this accent for life, and I'm comfortable enough with that. I've done a whole range of things since I've been in Australia, all in the professional learning space, a lot around behaviour support, and a lot around leadership and coaching. In the last couple of years, got really intrigued about, okay, what is it around the future, exponential technologies, what might those mean for those of us working directly with students, and also very much for the students we interact with. So students entering high school, obviously they start school a lot younger than that, the rate of change is, is absolutely significant. So I'm going to share a bit about exponential change, just to give us a sense of where those things might be. If you want a copy of the slides, Twitter or LinkedIn is the best way, or just come and see me at the end, I'll give you a card. Happy to share the slides if that's uh, hopefully useful for you. I also want to share, and uh, the main person in the future reorganization is very kindly uh, recording this for me, Jonathan Nalder at the back there, some of you may have heard speak yesterday. And I came across Jonathan's work and future, you as it was then, was trying to make sense of so much change so rapidly. So what do we do? How do we make sense of these things for ourselves and also for the children who are coming through? So and one of the big things that came clear to me was people work very, very hard in education, but are we working on the right things, the most important things, given that there is such rapid change that's occurring? And it came to a bit of a head for me going to uh, watch, uh, listen at a careers evening, where the careers evening and the school were doing a good job hadn't radically changed. Now, the number of people are going to have careers, where we go into a career when we leave university and stay in that career, is going to get less and less. Uh, and Jonathan, with the Future We community, has helped pull together a whole range of frameworks and literacies to help us make sense of where are we currently at, what's going well for us, where might we go, and what, what might we do to help prepare ourselves for that future. And the language that uh, the Future We community use and the framework uses really resonated with me. So I've come on board with Jonathan and I'll share a little bit of that as we go through the session. Given time being very much in the coaching and the leadership space, one of the things that's become clearer and clearer to me is that rather than looking for the answer, what we need to do is get better at asking the right questions. Because the answer is more and more readily available, uh, you know, in our hands, in our, in our handbags, in our pockets, we've got access to more knowledge than we've ever had. And it's increasing at an exponential rate. But if we don't ask the right questions, then uh, uh, is the answer we're going to get going to be useful and helpful to us? So a key for me in terms of where I'm headed, headed in my journey and my ongoing learn, learning journey is very much at the moment these are key learning questions for me. What might education and learning look like in the future? How do we help prepare staff, students and parents for a future that's on the horizon? What are some of the key drivers you know, that are influencing that? And then finally, what are the implications? And what can we do to help prepare ourselves and others for that future? Uh, it's interesting, some of the language and just something I was looking at that people were sharing yesterday. Quite a lot, often people talk about future-proofing. And I wonder when we shifted to a time when we had to be afraid of what was ahead rather than look to get forward in a hopeful manner. We've never been in a more abundant time and, and at possibilities, yet there's a lot of fear around what's coming and what might happen. And I think that's because a lot of the rhetoric and some of the language and some of the movies are very much in the dystopian, the, the, the negative side of things. So... I, I see myself very much a realistic optimist. What can I do? What can I do to influence things? I'm sure you've all heard of utopia and dystopia. So utopia is everything's going to be wonderful. Dystopia is everything's going to be shocking. I want you just to reflect just for a couple of seconds, where do you place yourself? Are you 
nearer utopia. It's all going to be okay. It's going to be a good future. Or are you more to the really fearful? It's going to be a bad future. I'm really worried about this. A word I got introduced to about 18 months ago that resonated particularly with my view of what I call a realistic optimist is protopia. Right? So utopia is not just going to happen. Dystopia is not just going to happen. What do we do in our daily interactions? How do we perceive things and what's our interactions to, to influence the future we want? So the opportunities have largely never been greater, but it's down to us as to whether we take them. And technology is a good example of that. You know, I heard a bit of the talk before, you know, is technology and access to the internet good or bad? In reality, it's neutral. It's what we as humans do with that access as makes it good and helpful or, or bad and un unhelpful. And that's a key component for me. Are we preparing not only ourselves but our sh children for the future that is ahead as part of that? Jonathan and I both reinvented our careers and are certainly in the process of continually reinventing what we do and how we do it from different purposes. But the ability to zoom right out, which is what really resonated with me, before we then zoom back in to take action. The risk is we get lost in talk and forget to do anything, forget to commit to action. And the, the other risk is we keep doing stuff because we're busier and busier, but we don't zoom out to think about are we working on what's important, not what's just urgent. And that's the, the pressure of life, isn't it, and particularly in schools, is it's more, more and more is asked of you know, the same people and we're not given opportunity to zoom out. So the chance to really zoom out around these. I'm not expecting, you know, I'm certainly not going through every bullet point here. A gentleman called Frank Diana, who I had uh, the honour of speaking to just <clears throat> last week, has pulled together, and again, this is why I said I'm happy to send you this. If not, if you Google Frank Diana <clears throat> on the benefits of internet access, he's pulled together the vast range of things that are in the past, so we can come into internet, social, mobile, cloud, big data, they're the things in many ways that are driving this move towards exponential change. Some of these things I'm sure you're very aware of, 3D printing, renewable energy, etc. So that's the down ones are the ones that are here or very nearly here. Not all of them have very much have hit schools at the moment and that's certainly something I'm passionate about is helping schools access what I'm calling learn tech to help them augment their learning, help teachers augment their teaching, and help leaders augment their leadership. So it's not about replacing people, because a human element in many ways becomes ever more important for us. But how do we influence and how do we access technology to help us? But then you can start to see a huge amount of things, and, and he's very much not into, and I agree with that, trying to make predictions about what will happen, but actually just being aware of the sorts of signals, and we'll come back to that in a minute. You know, and it comes up to radical life extension. And there's certainly some people I interact with, don't hold the same view, but some people I interact with who have a view that we will get to a point when we never die. Now, whether that's a good thing or bad thing, or whether they're philosophical things around all of that are interesting. Uh, but that's certainly where potentially it's heading. How do we have conversations with the young people and ourselves to how do we make sense of these really rapidly changing things? So in summary some of the key things and this is to some extent you know when we hear figures like 30 to 70 percent of jobs are going to be impacted and I heard just the other day 40 percent of jobs in the financial in the banking industry could be automated tomorrow that's not about panicking anyone but you know the, the idea is these things are going to happen already and to think they're not going to start to emerge is, is naive because we know looking back through history things change but I do believe, I have a strong belief, that there are new opportunities that will emerge. But in many ways, we don't know what those will be. Again, children in school, something like 40 to 50%, if not higher, of jobs, we don't even know. They haven't even been invented yet. So how do we prepare kids for this future where we can't talk about you know, a job or a career in the normal sense that I certainly grew up with that? This is one of the really interesting frames a reference to me because as humans we are linear thinkers we've been designed to think linearly you know and I'll show you a graphic in a minute that sort of really jumps it out even further but if you know you take 30 steps roughly one meter a step 30 meters 
All right, I'm 30 meters. I'm sort of just over there. If you do it exponentially, 26 trips around the world by the time I've taken that 30 step, 30th step. So every time it doubles. And we're on the cusp of just the, the amazing coming together of things where radical things are going to change rapidly, increasingly quickly. And I don't know, again, in the conversation with Frank Diana, reflecting on the last 10 years compared to the 10 years previous to that, you can start to see some of the signs of that. You know, smartphones didn't exist just over 10 years ago. Yet how ubiquitous they are to everything we do. And the thought, in many ways, of not having a smartphone and being able to access those, it can be really, really challenging to us. This, uh, I think, is, is also helpful and useful just to give us a sense. You know, I'll let it run through a couple of times. But you can see, for a long time, we don't, it doesn't look like anything's going to happen. Then very quickly, it radically, rapidly fills up. Yeah, so let it run through one more time. So at the moment, you'll see where it's getting closer to us, which is about now. And within the next few years, potentially, it's, ra it's rapidly going to change. At the moment, AI is about the, the, the sentience, the, the, the cognizance of around a, a, a rat, if that. So it's a long way to humans, but suddenly it can start teaching itself. Nope, wrong way. So I'm going to share some frameworks to help us make sense. How do we make sense of these things that are changing, starting to change rapidly and are only going to get quicker? Okay, and this isn't about fear. This is about helping us make sense of a world that's going to change more quickly than we've ever known it before in, in, in civilization. This is one of the, I'm going to share sort of three or four frameworks then some real tools to help you go away and, and hopefully use either with yourself, with your colleagues, even with students to start to think about what future do we want to come about and how do we influence that? If we just sit back, the future's going to happen, but is that the future we want? And we can't control it, but we can influence it, and I'm very strong belief in that. And uh, Professor Sahel Inyatulla has done a lot of work in future studies, and this made sense to me to think about, okay, what is the likely future? We don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes, never mind the next 10 years, but we can have a sense of what's happened and rather than just looking forward, we need to learn by looking back as well. And he talks about the push of the present. So what is happening, what, what's on the horizon from an education level, from a school level, to give us, a, give us a sense of these things are going to happen. It's unavoidable, you know, it's external. I can't control the growth of AI. But we know those are going to happen, this push of that. So that's pushing, that we've got no control of that. We can set visions and aspirations and they're really important to give a sense of hope not only for ourselves but the kids and people we interact with that there is a hope hopeful future as long as we're deliberate in what we do and how we want to bring things about but also recognizing the weight of history it's not easy to change an education I mean spent all my life in education I know it is a very very slow moving tanker that's probably being kind to it you know it's been built up and developed for a very different time. Now, how do we turn it around? And this is partly what really resonates with me. We need to be able to share stories of what might be, because otherwise it just gets too hard, too challenging, and we tend to bunker down and get defensive. It's a natural part of being human, that is. Can't make sense of the future, so I'm just going to ignore it or I'm going to reject it. And people might, I'm sure we'll have very different views here, but I'm just going to throw out there climate change. In many ways, for me, I think we need to change the conversation around climate change rather than from what, you know, how much of humans influence global climate change, because we know it's warming. There's you know, irrefutable evidence about that. To rather than is it humans that have caused this, as opposed to it's a natural cycle, we know it's happening, so what can we do to influence it in a more positive way, rather than debating whether we caused it or not? It's almost that, that's too late, that conversation. <laughs> Let's move into a more positive, productive conversation. This one covers a much wider range. So a gentleman called Joseph Foros, who's uh, based down in Melbourne. And he encourages people to think about a range of possible futures that go in a range of possible ways. And lots of things, just to think about scenarios. And again, I'll come back to scenarios a little bit later. Scenarios can be help, helpful to, for us to make sense of what might be emerging. So this is where the dotted line is where we're currently at. Projected future. If nothing changed, this is what, where it would be. And again, you can do this about your 
own life, you can do it about schools, you can do it about education, whatever construct you want to put this through. Then we start to talk about what's the probable future, all right, based on what's happened in the past, what's likely to happen? Yeah, what current trends, what do we think is on the horizon that might influence that? Then we've got plausible, could happen. All right, so we're starting to stretch our thinking, which gradually for most of us gets more and more uncomfortable as we get to the fringes here. But it's important to have a sense of what might happen and the end point of all of these is to then make a choice. Which one are we most drawn to? Which one would we like to bring about and what can we do to influence that? Then we go into, into uh, possible. So what might happen around all of these things? Yeah, so again, we need to be able to read the signals on the horizon and I'll share some strategies that futurists and foresight uh, people f use to give them a sense of, you know, how did Frank Diana come up with that graph of what might be on the horizon? He hasn't sat in isolation doing that. He's trying to read signals that are very, very quiet, some of those, and interact with people who are thinking way beyond where we're currently at. You might even then go into preposterous, won't ever happen. So I'm going to throw out there, and whether this is preposterous or not, but is, you know, in, in the future there will, there will be no schools. You know, that could be in, in a number of these in areas, depending on your perspective. So I don't know. I've got no idea whether it is. But certainly for many people, that would be seen as preposterous. There's got to be schools. Where do the kids go? How do they learn, etc.? Then out of all of those, we start to talk about pref preferable. What would we prefer? And what can I do in the here and now? What can we do to influence it? The ripple effect. So we can't do it in isolation. One person isn't going to dramatically do that. But I think it was Margaret Wheatley or someone like that talked about, or maybe Margaret Atwood, might have got one of them wrong, which one, it, what Margaret it was. You know, change, don't, you know, never underestimate the power of a small number of people getting together to influence and create change. In fact, that's how it's always happened. So it has to start somewhere, and, and why not with us as individuals? So how do we make sense? And this is, again, from Dr. Alina Hiltonen. Probably pronounced that totally wrong, but weak signals analysis. How do we start to make sense of what is on the horizon? Partly is being very aware of, increasingly, what we access is, goes through, a, is filtered. It's not just Facebook that filters it and puts us in our own little bubble. Increasingly, we're like to be filtered, again, partly because there's so much out there. So how do we make sense of it? We're more likely to trust and listen to views, people like us. The hard way to do that, we're more likely to trust people like us because that's, that's how we initially came to stay safe with each other. They like me, they're more likely to, to be safe with those sorts of people. But there's a real risk that we miss out on lots of knowledge and information as a consequence of that. So she talks about interpretation, all right? And it goes from weak to strong. So are things really well understood to not well understood? So I'm going to throw one out there, sentient AI. So sentient means conscious AI that can think in a way that humans do. Now, if you look at the Hollywood movies, you think it's around the corner. Some people think it's 10 years away. Some people think it's centuries away. But it's, we still don't fully understand human consciousness. So until we do, then there's a sense that that's probably quite a way away. So I would suggest that is a very weak, all right, a weak interpretation of it. Media, are there a few stories or many stories? All right, these just give us clues. They're not the answer, but they can give us signals, that signals to work out where are things at. Are we seeing lots of stories or not many stories? Again, we've got to be mindful our diet, our media diet is like to be narrow within our own sort of bubble. So making sure we don't, we're, we're aware of what are we not hearing, not seeing as part of this. And then climate change, this, the last one is the ice core samples. All right, so that's a long time ago. So we know that Earth goes through climate change over many, many years because they've analysed core samples. But again, that, that's, that's centuries ago. But increasing amounts of, you know, polar melting, freak weather conditions happening more and more. People are experiencing that. We're seeing that. So there's sort of stronger evidence around it. So forget number four. 
three questions to ask ourselves around that. How observable is it? How, many, how much do we see or hear that in the media? And how stable and established, from a scientific perspective, is the, is the evidence that's coming through to me? So, Future We, we talk very much about helping all of us be future ready. So it's not about, you know, um, blocking out. It's not a negative perspective. We don't need to protect ourselves from the future. But how do we prepare ourselves to be as ready as possible? In many ways, I should invite Jonathan up here to talk about <laughs> I won't, but I invite him to talk about the framework because he's very much started that and has involved many, many people from around the world. It's just at version 11. Uh, and that's the, the website, and feel free to go on that. And you can map yourself. You can do a self-assessment, take five minutes or the longer version to have a sense of what is the sorts of things that will help us all be future-ready, either individually, collectively, organizationally, or team-wise for a rapidly changing future. It starts, well, it doesn't start. It depends on it, where you're going to, but the explore. It's deliberately using the word play. You know, play and dream are often sort of not almost not allowed as we get older, yet we think there are increasingly importance in that creativity bit, just being assured. Let's explore what might happen here. How do we work together? That's certainly a real point of difference for us for the foreseeable future or certainly the, the near future. Then how do we start to bring it into something happening as a consequence of this, the design space? How do we map and plan? So we're not just thinking about things, we're actually bringing them into action. Deliver directly. How do we make this project real? So something happens as a consequence of this thinking process. So thinking is very good, important strategy, but we're even better when we move it into the doing space as well. So it's not just thinking, we're actually doing. And we take ourselves, and you'll see a bit more, more detail, but it sits behind this in a minute, and then we share it. If it's just me doing it, then it's going to have limited impact, limited effect around all of that. Again, there are 45, something like that. Yeah, things that sit behind it, but you've got some of the key, key themes, the key literacies in many ways that we think sit around any of those. So I'm not going to go through all of them. As I say, you can get a sense of those. Just pick some of those out as part of it. Linking to the leadership side of things, I think, you know, the, the idea, importance of resilience. You know, if I'm not demonstrating resilience as a leader, what are the impact on those people around me? The ripple effect of how I am is really important. And being aware of myself, but also the, the people I am leading is part of it. Teamwork is, you know, whether it's an obvious one, but it's obviously a really important one. But empathy, being able to understand and reflect and, and connect ourselves with people who may have diff different worldviews. Again, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but the whole issue of AI and ethics is of, of certainly stronger than a weak signal, I would say. There's increasing the conversations around that. Uh, but then I'm starting to think of, so whose ethics are they? Because there's no one overarching global agreed ethical dimensions, ethical frameworks that we sit under. So Western ethics are quite likely to be different to some extent from Eastern ethics, from African ethics to different cultures. So who chooses as to which are the right ethics that we judge AI and how it's developed as part of that? Leadership is there. How do we make sure and lead to make sure things are developed. And again, the best leaders, in my view, have a great ability to share stories and communicate with people. As I say, that's where you can access that. Feel free to, and please do, go and take the self-assessment. Say so the five-minute version gives you a sense of where you can rate yourself. How am I traveling in relation to these different things? Where am I currently at? Where might I go to to help me get a bit better? The aim isn't that we're going to get great in all of them, but particularly in team approaches, how might we pull together? So I might be good at, at some of these, but the most effective teams are going to be across most of these. So who, who are we missing? Who's got strengths in this area that maybe I haven't got strengths in? And you can see how it can make a really powerful team organization if we're across those between us. So scenario planning uh, is a crucial way of starting to try and make sense of telling stories of what might be. Humans, we base, our basis has always been around stories. That's how we make sense of the world, of our histories. But also of our futures is increasingly important. So you can, 
There is a, a thing called a, the uh, paradox of choice. Too many, and that's often where we're headed in many ways, too much information, too much knowledge out there. How do we make sense of what to choose? And that's why we're quite safe in our little bubbles at the time. So, so Hale talks about identifying four. And yes, you can do this individually, but more powerful if we're accessing other people as part of this. And it could, absolutely. One could be no change. If this continues in this current journey, education and learning, this is where we like to be in five or ten years. We can look back and have a sense of where it's likely to be. All right. Then marginal change, all right? Some tweaks around the edges, some things that are coming in from technology that will influence it slightly more strongly. What might happen there? Adaptive change, where what's, what's coming on the horizon that's going to make mean that we have to change it. Interestingly, one of the, the fastest growing education market in Australia, America, not sure about the UK, but I think the UK, is home education. So if, if there isn't certain ad adaptations or, you know, from the system perspective, then what's the, the long-term implications of that? And the final one, radical change. I'm not saying this is what I'm suggesting, but it could be. Okay, let's suggest that schools no longer exist. Okay, what might that look like? When you sort of map out those different scenarios, then you think, which of those do we, are we most drawn towards? Then you can start to think about, okay, what are we going to do individually, collectively, that will influence that's the direction it takes, as, a, as opposed to sitting passively and just waiting for it to happen to us. And I do have a strong belief, individually, we can make a difference, and we do make a difference. Yeah, it's not down to just any one person, but collect, you know, individually, we pull together with people like us. And another tool that can be really helpful and useful in this space, it's called a user's guide to the future. All right, the final one I'm going to share with you, given it's a Saturday afternoon, but uh, it's from a gentleman called Mark McCurgo, who's done a lot of work in solutions focused, and he talks about host leadership. And in host leadership, he talks about single most important question for a leader in any one moment is do I step forward or do I step back? So the risk is we're lost in hero leaders, so who's going to rescue? Who's going to rescue us from this situation? Or servant leaders, which comes from a good premise, but it's quite a negative connotation as servant. So who leads if, if they're looking after everyone? So he talks about sometimes you need leaders to step forward and to give us inspiration and guidance, to reassure, give us a sense of where we're heading, sometimes to come back and be very much part of the team, to be clearing up, to be tidying up at the end of that. And basically, it's uh, four steps. I'll talk about the fifth one in a minute. Be clear about the future you want. Because if we're not clear about the future we want, how are we going to influence that to come about? All right. Yes, it might change. We don't know if we're going to get there. But they talk about future perfect, or it could be preferred future. How do we want? Do you see how this connects to the scenarios? So once we've identified our preferred scenario, we can then think, okay, what can we do, I do, that might influence our direction in that? So... Be as clear as possible about what future perfect is. Then you take a step back. So if future perfect is here, and this is, I'm going to make it the number up, five years into the future, you might say, okay, what needs to be in place three years from now, because now is over there, for the best chance for future perfect to come around? So what are the precursors, what are the building blocks that will give, in three years' time, that will give us our best chance of the five-year future perfect coming about? Then you come all the way back down here. Can't do it. Don't want to go behind the podium. Um, to year one or the next month. So what are some small steps we could take in the next weeks, months, that will help bring about those uh, precursors that will help bring about the future perfect? Then what we're looking for and writing down, what will be some signs that we're heading in the right direction? What will we hear? What will we see that will suggest the steps we're taking are adding value and we're headed in the right direction. Now, in the middle, they so they've got middle gaps, so that might be year one, year two, year three, or year four, year five. So what happens in this middle bit? So rather than trying to analyze and predict every step along the way, because things shift and change, he calls it ant country. Now, this is quite controversial in many ways, because in education, we have to write action plans that detail every step along the way. He says, don't worry about it. Don't, don't think about this middle bit. If you look at ants, there seems to be all sorts of chaos, yet they can create and have a clear structure of what's going to happen. Yeah, but so there's lots of messiness here that we don't know, but we'll get clearer as we move towards it. 
So our future perfect and our precursors, we check in occasionally. And that could be, it could be, you know, one month is probably a bit too short, but it could be one year, you could do this, it could be 10 years, it could be 100 years, potentially. So you can use it whichever time frame is helpful and useful for you and whoever you're working with. So your future perfect and your precursors, keep checking in, but are unlikely to change radically. But your small steps are constantly changing. And your signs are, are we heading in the right direction? Yeah, so it gives you a sense of, you know, so it moves you from your scenario. What we're doing in the here and now, is it influencing us towards our preferred scenario? And in the moment, as we move through it, we might need to adapt and shift our thinking, our actions, but we've constantly got that overview effect. Where, where do we want to head towards? How are we influencing that? So, can't control it, you know, and we can't predict it, but we can influence it. And so that's very much uh, the essence of the talk. So, and thank you very much for staying with me, folks. Really appreciate that. A sense of, okay, that yes, we need to be able to dream, we need to be able to tell stories of where the future might be, but as importantly, we then need to take action, we need to take steps. And that's very much about where my belief and uh, passion comes from and the work we do at Future We is encouraging people into what can we do to be as future ready as possible. Thank you very much.